Hello, everybody. I'm Daniel Kurtzer, a professor at the School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton, and I want to welcome you to this panel on Israeli politics after the ceasefire, whenever that will be. Uh, we will have a second panel on Palestinian politics after the ceasefire this coming Wednesday, also 12.30 to 1.30. That'll be hosted by our dean, Professor Amani Jamal. Uh, you can register for that uh, panel at spia.princeton.edu. Uh, we also will be uh, answering some of your questions today, so please use the Q&A function and we'll curate them uh, once the uh, panelists have a chance to uh, make their points of view and I will ask a few questions. We have an extraordinary panel of uh, colleagues, so longstanding friends and real experts on this subject. Uh, Dr. Dahlia Scheinlin is a political strategist who has advised on nine national campaigns in Israel and worked on elections, referendums, and public affairs campaigns in 15 other countries over the last 25 years. She's a regular columnist for Haaretz, a policy fellow at the Century International, at Century International, and she has a book out, a new book, The Crooked Timber of Democracy in Israel, Promises Unfulfilled. Dahlia will address Israeli politics, elections, polls, and the prospects for the extreme right, among other issues, focusing on trends since October 7th. Uh, Natan Sachs is the director of the Brookings Institution Center for Middle East Policy and a senior fellow in its foreign policy program. His research focuses on Israel's foreign policy, its domestic politics, and on U.S. policy toward the Middle East. Natan will speak on the administration's role, if any, in Israeli politics and the change in their behavior with regard to quote unquote intervening in Israeli politics. He will also assess what difference a Gantz government might make in terms of Israel's overall diplomatic relations. Dr. Shira Efron, who has a, a bit of a, a cold today, so we're gonna absolve her of her opening statement, is the Diane and Guilford Glazer Foundation Senior Director of Policy Research. She also serves as a special climate change advisor to the Israeli Ministry of Defense and is the co-chair of the subgroup on regional cooperation of President Herzog's Climate Forum. She was previously a consultant with the United Nations country team in Jerusalem, specializing in Gaza access issues. I'm gonna ask uh, Dahlia and Natan to uh, open us up with uh, 10, 12, 15 minutes of uh, remarks. Uh, I'll then offer Shira an opportunity, uh, in the meantime, getting her voice in better shape to provide a little commentary. I'll ask a few questions, but if you have questions from the audience, please put them in the Q&A function, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. So without further ado, Dahlia, over to you, uh, once you unmute. Okay. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I'm going to try to take the first 12, 15 minutes and talk through where we are in terms of Israeli politics, uh, what we see the public, uh, how we see the public reacting to the situation uh, as expressed through public opinion research and what we can imagine might be the coalition dynamics and uh, electoral dynamics coming up in the future. Um, and I wanna start by positing that there are two contradictory things going on in Israeli society right now to kind of set the stage for some of the more in the weeds, you know, uh, details that I want to get into. Those two contradictory things that I would propose keeping in mind are that it, like all societies in wartime or most societies, there is a rally round the flag effect that has basically swept through Israeli society since the 7th of October, since Hamas's attack and the ensuing war. And, and that means that Israelis are rallying. They're rallying in certain ways. But the main way they're rallying is for themselves. In other words, the state, people were deeply disappointed by the you know, inc incompetence and, and absence of the state in terms of the failure to um, anticipate and prevent the attack and the failures to serve the needs of the public in the midst of and in the days and weeks following the attack. And so civil society flooded in to really support one another. And that led to a great sense of social resilience, a great sense of social solidarity, uh, everything I say about Israeli society is backed by polls, but I, I or is drawn from polls, I should say. But I don't want to, you know, go through every single number. So that's one thing that's happening. 
But the interesting contradiction uh, is that we've seen at the same time, following, you know, in accordance with the disappointment that I mentioned, that there is a different kind of uh, um, process beyond the rally round the flag effect, and that is a drastic plunge in support and expressions of anger against the current government. So again, in most countries, you would see that the rallying effect leads to support for the war effort and for the government. In this case, we're seeing the opposite. The government had already seen a significant decline in support in all surveys throughout 2023 due to the deeply unpopular attempts to undermine the independence of the Israeli judiciary and the backlash. After the war, those trends uh, accelerated. And so the government at this point, the original pre-war coalition in all surveys has lost about a third of its support. It started out with 64 seats. It's now regularly polling within the range of as low as 42, as high as 48 seats out of 120 in the Knesset. Uh, Netanyahu himself is trailing in head-to-head -head surveys when he's matched up with the closest competitor, Benny Gantz. He's trailing by double digits in all polls, although the range varies somewhat. And his party, Likud, has lost between 40 and 50% of its support. So Likud had 32 seats in all polls. It has ranged from 16 to 19 seats, currently at around 18 seats, very consistently. So that's one sort of tangent. Now, the other thing that we're seeing, um, along with back on the rallying side, is support for the war in everything that Israel does. So uh, in all the kinds of surveys that test different aspects of the war, we see very high support in the Jewish public. I have to specify that because there's a very opposite dynamic among the Arab citizens of Israel or Palestinian citizens of Israel who are much more critical of, for example, uh, the amount of force being used, the civilian casualties in Gaza, um, and issues like the hostages and whether they should be you know, released in exchange for a ceasefire are divisive. So I'll put those aside for a minute. Um, and that support for the war goes along with something that we see in a very consistent way in Israel over the last 25 years, which is that when there is a war an es or an escalation, and particularly when it involves attacks on Israeli civilians, Israelis move to the right. And they move to the right Again, not, my, not in my perception, but in their own perception. When you ask people to define themselves in surveys, are you right, left, or center? And we, of course, we give gradations of that. Generally, war, especially this kind of war that began with a, you know, with a, with a really drastic uh, attack on civilians, leads people to move to the right, sometimes immediately. And oftentimes, these are patterns that you know, set into place over many years. For example, during and after the Second Intifada, although after the Second Intifada, in the early 2000s, that process kind of took years to set in and then continued over the course of many years. So this is a long time, uh, you know, a long tested pattern in and following wartime in Israel in, in the last couple of decades. You could argue uh, for somewhat different effects of war in previous decades, but not in recent years. So the question is, um, why has Israeli society not become more right wing? And this is the third major point that I will make for the opening. Uh, general observations, and then I'll get into some of the weeds. The third major observation is that if Israelis are moving further to the right or can be expected to move further to the right, both in terms of self-definition and in terms of their very strong or certainly Jewish population, very strong support for the war, why do they not continue to move further to the right if, if their support for Likud and Netanyahu is dropping? Why are they not moving more to the further right parties, particularly uh, the ultra-nationalist uh, parties of the religious ultra-nationalists called the two parties called uh, religious Zionism and uh, Jewish power parties, which are kind of a repository for people who share either ultra-nationalist views, Jewish supremacist views, um, and either a religious or very hard line and a little less religious and are not the ultra-Orthodox parties. Those parties are not actually doing any better than they were before the war by most surveys. There have been moments when they've done a little better, but those seem to be the anomalies. As I mentioned, the pre-war coalition is broadly in all surveys losing votes, which means of course, none of the parties are gaining particularly. So if people are supporting the war, rallying to the war, moving to the right and dropping off from support for Netanyahu, why are they not going to the further right? These are the kinds of uh, questions that I think are out there. And I think that the broad answer you know, I won't leave you in suspense. The broad answer for why people are not going to the further right parties has to do with the first point I made about how support for this government had been dropping in 2023 uh, th throughout that whole year 
of you know, extreme opposition to the government's signature plan. And in fact, it became the government's exclusive plan, the judicial reforms that were intended to undermine judicial independence and an understanding of just how extreme um, and to what aims that government was trying to make those changes, right? To, um, to implement a kind of, you know, Jewish superiority in Israel, undermine equality, undermine the constitutional order such as it is in Israel uh, and expand occupation, as well as establish a more theocratic society. That kind of thing led to the initial decline and is probably limiting just how far people are moving along the electoral spectrum. Okay, and this is where I'll go a little bit deeper into some of the details we see because it will help us set the stage for what we can imagine will be the political dynamics in terms of elections. Um, so where are we in terms of elections? Well, I think that you know, many people uh, were saying after October 7th, that's it, this government is over and Netanyahu's done. Um, it's never a good, it's never, um, it's never that wise to predict Netanyahu's downfall, okay? Um, because Netanyahu always comes back. And it seems like in this case, you know, when uh, when we were discussing the questions earlier, uh, is, you know, is is Netanyahu, will he, will he, will he, you know, can his government last? The answer is yes, his government can last partly because he's expanded his government through the war cabinet by bringing in the party of Benny Gantz, which has most recently split into uh, smaller factions, but he still has expanded an expanded coalition majority. And there is no, you know, the kinds of things that could lead his government to collapse um, are either there's an internal political crisis and we can talk about the kinds of things that would spark that crisis. It's not necessarily the things you might predict. I mean, the obvious one would be if this government goes for a ceasefire and then some of the original you know, extremist coalition partners are against that. Um, it could have something to do with being pushed towards, uh, it, you know, um, seems like there's global headwinds to force Israel to uh, accept returning to the idea of a two-state solution, at least in theory, that could divide the government. More likely and more imminently, we're about to have a crisis over the, uh, the bill or the ongoing 75 year argument about conscripting ultra Orthodox Israelis who have essentially enjoyed an exemption. These are all candidates for political crises in the government, uh, but the government doesn't have to collapse that way. There can also be a vote of uh, constructive no confidence, which means that there is an alternative coalition established without elections. That's also a possibility. And so those are some of the mechanisms by which there might be a government change or collapse or elections or not elections. But let me remind you what this list does not include. In other words, the kinds of things that would not cause the government to collapse or have to be reconstituted. Uh, protests, mass protests. I think a lot of people are banking on this idea that once this war is over or downscaled, there's going to be huge mass protests and it, the government will not be able to withstand them. I'm a little skeptical. It's true that in Israel's history, there are moments in which mass protests led to either resignation of prime minister um, or deep unpopularity that eventually led to uh, a, pr a prime minister resigning, but mostly for other reasons. So it's it's a little bit uh, murky to say that protests can truly prompt uh, a government shakeup like that. But more than that is simple evidence of the last year. Israel saw the biggest and most enduring protests ever in its history, and in fact, bigger than most countries will ever see. You know, hundreds of thousands of people on the streets for 39 weeks, and the government barely blinked. Maybe it slowed down uh, its initial program, its policy program, and you know, was forced to kind of dismantle it a little bit or, or roll it back somewhat, but trust me, it's coming back in other ways. In other words, this is not a government that heeds public uh, expressions of discontent uh, through political change very easily. Um, now, let me also give you a sense of where the opposition is. I mean, if you consider Benny Gantz's party, which was called National Unity and has joined as joined the war cabinet and thereby the coalition, um, is the leading party in polls, okay? Um, and the question of whether he can win an election is a fair one because he's leading very consistently. Just to give you some of the numbers, in most polls, he's getting between 38 and 40 seats. Although lately he's been on the decline just a little bit, again, out of 120 parliamentary seats, so leading over Likud by more than twice as many seats. His popularity is much higher than Netanyahu's in surveys. He looks like a unifying figure. Um, and so one would think he's a shoe in for the next elections. 
But this brings me back to my previous point. We don't know when next elections will be. We don't even know what will prompt the next elections. And even if they were called tomorrow, which they are not, there would be three months until they could actually be held by law. And in three months, everything can change. And so, um, you know, we, most of us in general in Israel, in between election cycles, you have to be very cautious about what look like dramatic polling dynamics because they are likely to change in, in a general situation, especially because we're in a kind of unprecedented situation. Um, I think that, you know, the last two points that I'll try to make before I turn it over um, are about the far right and about Netanyahu's plan for the next election. So Netanyahu would like the next election to, obviously he's, you know, gonna be coming at it from a very weak position. <clears throat> he is roundly blamed, you know, again, he has, barely 25% to 34, you know, between one quarter and one third who think he is the most, you know, preferred or suitable candidate to be prime minister, uh, as many as, you know, 40, uh, well, let's say 47 to 50% prefer Gantz. He is standing trial. His government is doing poorly. He's going to be taking a lot of heat for what happened. No matter when the next elections are held, that will certainly be his most vulnerable point. He would like for the elections to be about the issue of who can stand up to global pressure. I think we know that based on what he's done just over the last few days in terms of his response to President Biden's taking a somewhat more uh, rhetorically assertive position. I emphasize rhetorically because I don't think we know exactly how or if this will play out in terms of significant policy steps by the US to pressure Israel. But nevertheless, Netanyahu has gone, has become you know, firm in pushing back against against the president. Even I would remind people on Friday evening, you know, um, uh, communicating to the press that he's affirmed, that he's confirmed or approved the plans to invade, to expand the ground operation to Rafah, which was, you know, which is certainly pushing the boundaries of American tolerance. He would also like for it to be about him being the only statesman who can fight off global pressure to go back to the idea of a two-state solution and establishment of a Palestinian state. And this is contributing to an enormous gulf between the reigning paradigm in the international community and certainly among, I think, you know, the liberal leaning American Jewish community and, you know, Israeli society. And Netanyahu knows that he's on pretty firm ground at home by taking that position. And that's because the moment this war began, support for a two-state solution, even in the general conceptual way, was already at a low point well, even before this government was established. I should say it's been a, support has been eroding for a decade among both sides. That's a mirror image. And it was only about a third of Jewish Israelis who supported the two-state solution before even this government was established. After the war, that's, that number has gone down to about a quarter of Jewish Israelis, still majority support among Palestinian citizens, and therefore the average is about 30%. A minority, Netanyahu knows that, and that's where he wants the elections uh, to that's what he wants the arguments to be over because he knows he'll win. The final point is just what I said about the far right. I mean, I think Israelis will be are are feeling very hard line right now and militant, but there is a a kind of mitigating force, which is that a they blame everybody in this government, and which includes the ultra nationalist parties, and b I think there is a concern with what the participation um, and power of those ultra-nationalist and very extremist, you know, neo-Kahanist, supremacist parties, theocratic, authoritarian, et cetera, what that has meant for where Israel went in 2023, neglecting other governing priorities, um, prioritizing the wrong things and putting the citizens at risk and essentially breaching the contract uh, the, between citizens and the state, first and foremost, in terms of physical protection. And so I think that is currently um, holding back uh, greater support for the extremist, ultra-nationalist right-wing parties. Uh, but I have to qualify everything that I just said with, we are in an unprecedented situation. We don't really know where the politics of this are going on the electoral level for the next you know, number of months. And I, I think we have to really be, show a little humility in terms of predictions, but that's my analysis of what I see so far. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dahlia. That's a, a great launch to our discussion, if uh, even a bit uh, a bittersweet. Uh, Natan, over to you. Thanks so much, Dan. And it's a pleasure to be with uh, Dahlia and Shira, despite the very unpleasurable times. Um, we see the Biden administration today in a very different position than it was 
already immediately after the horrific events of October 7th, President Biden stood by Israel in very dramatic fashion, both showing solidarity in, in a way that he is very well adept at showing, of course, but also voicing some very concrete points. The first was deterrence against the escalation of the war beyond uh, the conflict in Gaza, of clear warning to any country or organization hinting at Iran and Hezbollah, and backing that up with uh, aircraft carrier groups, first one and then another to the Mediterranean and then the Gulf. But he also stood by Israel in another sense. He identified very clearly with the objectives of the Israeli campaign. And despite a lot of rhetoric, some of it horrific rhetoric, the Israeli objectives have been more defined than many abroad appreciate. The first has been the removal of Hamas, not from existence, not to destroy Hamas, but to remove Hamas as a governing body in the Gaza Strip and a body able to threaten Israel from the Gaza Strip. Not That is not always the rhetoric, of course, of many of the ministers, but those are the objectives handed down also to the military and the way that the operation was uh, designed. That is a very, very difficult, and as we can see, extremely bloody effort, uh, but it is much more defined and in theory achievable than um, evaporating Hamas from the face of the earth. The second major goal from, for the Israelis was the return and remains for the Israelis is the return of the hostages. And of course, from day one, there was a tension between those two. The hostages are the main card that Hamas holds and therefore achieving aim number one can come in, in direct conflict with aim number two. And we're seeing that today. We're seeing that in the debates in Israel, even inside the war cabinet, the mini war cabinet that was formed. It was formed, as Alia mentioned, the main opposition party of Benny Gantz, together with Gadi Eisenkot, joined. Um, and they were brought into a mini war cabinet that was designed to exclude the most extremists of the far right, Ben Gvir and Smotrich in particular, by creating a far smaller body that has the authority, the legal authority, uh, to govern the war. It's essentially bestowed with the legal authority of commander in chief, which generally resides within a, within a wider security cabinet that would include Smotrich and Ben Gvir. Um, and these are the debates right now, the debates over the hostage deal. There is a major hostage, hostage uh, deal proposal uh, for a ceasefire that was presented to Hamas. Now Hamas has replied, and we're, we're again in, in these debates. There was hope and even some optimism in Washington that that could be reached before Ramadan. Obviously, we're now in Ramadan, um, but perhaps it could be reached soon. That would be extremely important for the, from the administration's point of view, but I should say from all of our point of views, I would allow enormous amounts of AIDS, hopefully, to enter the Gaza Strip, and hopefully very large numbers of the remaining hostages those are still alive to be released. It would not include all of them in the beginning, but it would be important. There was a third aim that President Biden spoke of very early on, and that was adherence to international law and, in a sense, um, a, a stress over the humanitarian side of what would happen in the Gaza Strip. And that was always a less, uh, a far lesser important objective for Netanyahu, in particular because the Israelis have a very different view of the Gaza Strip. For most Israelis, Gaza was a foreign statelet governed by a Palestinian government, Hamas, for the past 16 years. Whereas for most Palestinians and many abroad, it was simply occupied by other means uh, by Israel, despite the fact that Israel left or that it had a border with Egypt, this was still under occupation. As a result, Israelis view the Gaza Strip for many reasons, but also for this reason, view the Gaza Strip as an enemy country, one that they would not be expected to support in time of war. Um, and so there's a lot of indignation among many Israelis I speak to, including this morning, I have to say, over the idea that Israel is uh, under enormous international program for the very, very dire humanitarian uh, situation in the Gaza Strip, and something that is very high on the concern of the administration, uh, both for substantive reasons and for political ones, of course. This led as I said, to a very strong support by the Biden administration, but in much more recent times, we see a clear break and clear signs of a decision within the administration uh, to show real daylight between not the US and Israel, but US and Netanyahu. And one of the big signs was a visit by Benny Gantz, the same Benny Gantz here to Washington, to the White House. He met with Vice President Harris. Um, I'll note that Netanyahu, since the formation of this coalition, the very far right coalition, has not been invited to the White House. And as a result, he has forbidden other ministers from visiting Washington for official visits. Some of them have showed up in town, but they have not had official visits with their counterparts. The most obvious example is uh, Yoav Gallant, the Minister of Defense, who 
by normal routine would be visiting the Pentagon on a very regular basis to discuss any number of routine a collaboration between the two. Dan, as former ambassador, you can tell us more, more than anyone about that. And Gallant has not visited the Pentagon. He has met with Secretary Austin. He has done so usually in Europe, at Munich, and a variety of other places, but not here at the Pentagon. Um, Benny Gantz is now a senior minister, although without portfolio, and doing so, and doing so because he is not beholden to instructions by Netanyahu, um, which is both a clear sign of some independence by him, but also a very clear, clear sign from the administration. that They were eager to, to show that Gantz is an interlocutor and their preferred interlocutor, um, and one that has a stature that so far Netanyahu only had. And we see that in other signs as well. Uh, what would have been an unprecedented step by the administration, and in fact is very important in historical terms, um, sanctioning of extremist settlers in the West Bank, something that in out of the context of the war would have made huge headlines, has now of course been swallowed by the bigger headlines of the war, but that is again a signal and a signal of distance between the administration and certainly the far right of this coalition, and in theory a political headache for Netanyahu, although uh, less than it would be in, in peacetime. And of course, now we saw also Senate Majority, Majority Leader Schumer come out and speak very clearly about what he sees as a need for elections in Israel, a very clear uh, very clear speech about uh, foreign politics, so a dramatic step, of course. Schumer is, of course, Jewish and obviously the most senior Jewish person in the Senate. He's also the most senior senator, uh, period, um, and a very strong, longstanding supporter of Israel. So coming from him, it is really a, a very dramatic um, step. I'll note that uh, we can all recall before being vice president, Biden was a senator. It, it seems very, very unlikely to me that a senior senator like Schumer uh, with such close relations to Biden would be doing this completely freelancing. This is again a signal by Biden and the old guard administration, the very strong supporters of Israel in the Democratic Party uh, showing uh, very clear day daylight from Netanyahu. Now, this is in theory a risky move. Uh, intervening in foreign politics or nudging foreign politics uh, is considered inappropriate often. Uh, I think that can be taken too far. It's done all the time. But it is risky in the sense that it's hard to predict. As Dahlia said, the day after October 7th, uh, everyone was saying logically Netanyahu should be an ex-prime minister walking. In 2019, I myself authored a piece that got the title, The End is Nigh for Netanyahu. That was five years ago. And since then, I vowed I would never do so again. So in October, I did not. Uh, but that's not because I'm smart. It's just because I was uh, foolish once before. Um, and so it's risky. Nobody can tell exactly how it would go. And certainly Netanyahu has been, for a long time, since October, in fact, um, preparing for this kind of fight and maybe even hoping for it. Netanyahu has a history, especially with President Obama, of standing up, of seeking a diplomatic uh, battle over substantive issues, but actually reaping political benefit from that at home. I'll note that this is extremely risky for Netanyahu as well. I think the administration is probably correct in assessing that the median voter in Israel would like its prime minister to get along with the American president. That's usually been the case in history, um, and especially with this president. Biden is not Obama. Uh, Biden stood by Israel, as I said. In fact, in historical terms, he's really distinguished himself in that regard for Israelis, perhaps put him in one line with Truman and Kissinger as American uh, leaders standing beside Israel in true moments of crisis. Um, and in that regard, a fight with Biden could be quite dangerous for Netanyahu. They spoke just before we started this event for the first time in a month. Uh, we do not know the contents, which is actually rare. We have not seen a readout from the Israeli side. That's that's relatively rare. Um, the administration, so as I said, the administration is now seeking, um, in, in a sense, calling Netanyahu's bluff. Netanyahu tried to put this daylight and saying, I would be the one standing up to the world. Uh, he made clear distance between himself and mainstream views in the security establishment, and therefore views that he would expect, probably correctly, that Benny Gantz would support. For example, that the Palestinian Authority should have a major role in the Gaza Strip in a day after, whenever that comes. It's not going to be a day, of course. Um, and uh, also speak, potentially, of a future horizon of something resembling a Palestinian state or two-state solution, something that Gantz is not extremely lefty on, to, to be clear, uh, but one that would that would, would serve Netanyahu in a campaign against Gantz, saying, here is Gantz, who would be friendly to the Palestinian Authority, who, um, which is, of course, substantively a mistake for Netanyahu, and he knows that, uh, but uh, 
but politically perhaps astute. Um, and the, that, that's something the administration is now trying to do. To close, the administration has had, uh, as has been called the Biden doctrine, grand plans for the day after. And there too, there's been dramatic daylight between uh, Netanyahu and Biden. And here I would point out a very important difference between Gantz and Netanyahu. We, as we say, we should not count Netanyahu out, but we should also not rule out the possibility of elections. There are different mechanisms, Dahlia mentioned them. Elections still could certainly happen in 2024. Uh, and if they do, all polls suggest that Netanyahu would lose. And although Gantz is, um, is a centrist, and he really is a centrist, he's not the, the dream of many people abroad, um, he would be profoundly different from Netanyahu, both in terms of his standing domestically and the integrity that he um, shows, uh, but also as an interlocutor, a diplomatic interlocutor for the United States, and no, no less importantly for others, like the Egyptians, like the Palestinian Authority that I mentioned, um, secondarily also to the Jordanians. But in the context of Gaza, these two players, Egypt and the Palestinian Authority, potentially together with the Gulf as part of the Biden grand plan for the day after, this would be absolutely crucial. And so preparing for this kind of day after, I believe the, the administration has concluded, is simply not happening properly with Netanyahu. Uh, and therefore, uh, they are basically betting and hoping to even nudge in the direction of an alternative government, probably led by someone like Benny Gantz. Thank you, Natan. As a, a great uh, recap of a very challenging uh, context. Uh, over to Shira, to the extent that you can speak to us, we are looking forward to it. Um, hi, everyone. Good to be with you. And I apologize, my voice um, sounds like that. I'm a bit under the weather, but, but I will try and I'll try to be brief, but happy to answer questions. So, I, I mean, I agree with both uh, what uh, Dahlia and Natan said. I'll just try to um, hone a few of the points. You know, in terms of elections, what I am uh, hearing and what seems to be the desire of the Benny Gans, you know, who sees himself as ha as having the potential of breaking down the government, that this is a question, right? There are different mechanisms for how this government can uh, break apart, is that there will be elections by the end of the year uh, with, with, with an aspiration that the war will end by then. Um, and this means that it's not during this Knesset session, which uh, is about to end, but during uh, the next one, then you start thinking about it. Oh, but it can be in October because in October we'll be commemorating the uh, one year uh, to, to 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 obviously to the October seventh uh, attacks. It could be November, December, and this this could be uh, could be then, which means that we're probably going to start seeing. And and again, I I don't know that this is going to happen, but this is sort of the desire of the Benny Gantz and his his party. Um, which is hard for them to stay in the government, but on the other hand, they gain their popularity. Uh, they're most popular when they're in this government. Um, but we are going to start seeing uh, what we call a different right wing, uh, different right wing uh, players coming into um, coming into the arena. So started with uh, not going too much into the weeds, but Gidon Saar, who was Benny Gantz's uh, uh, partner in this party, uh, he just broke apart from him. Uh, Naftali Bennett, who was former prime minister, uh, he already said he's going to join, rejoin politics. Um, Yossi Cohen, former head of the Mossad, and it could be that this, uh, uh, if they unite or create several parties together, that they will determine the fate of this election. Um, so we, you know, at, at the moment, I think it's very hard, and Dalia here is the expert on public opinion, but it's very hard to poll uh, who do you support when there are no elections in sight. Um, and we don't have we don't have all the parties, uh, but but it, it will. It it's will easy to poll. It's hard to actually know anything. Right. OK. Yeah. No, polling is easy. Yes. Uh, deducting anything. But but I, but what's uh, what's. Um, what is interesting, I think, that Gidon Saar, um, who is extremely right-wing in his views, um, and uh, he uh, spoke to the press the other day and he said, you know, as long as we were focusing on the judicial overhaul, judicial coup, uh, as uh, and domestic issues in Israel, it was easy for me to work with Benny Gantz and, and because we agree on these things. But if the next election is going to be about the future, you know, the establishment of a Palestinian state, this is where we need to break apart. So this, this is interesting in a sense that um, there are going to be uh, several players 
that are going to pose themselves with Netanyahu in standing up to the idea of a Palestinian state. He's definitely not going to be the only one. Um, you know, broader, I think that people who are uh, not in Israel and haven't been to Israel since October 7, it's interesting that Israelis, uh, we, you know, we, we said it's not startup nation now, it's the PTSD nation, but in fact, the, the country is still in, in the trauma, it's not in the post trauma. I think that up, up until a couple of weeks ago, it still felt like we were still on October 7, which is everything that was analyzed still basically counting the dead and speaking about heroic and, uh, and painful stories from, from, from that day. And the media, the Israeli press, the Israeli media, Israeli TV, uh, uh, um, enact self-censorships in showing what's happening in Gaza. So in a sense, what the what, what Americans and the rest of the world uh, sees on uh, TV, um, and you know, we all live in our echo chambers, right? It's very different from what Israelis see. So Israelis really cannot, it's not that they are, I mean, they are rallying to the flag as Dalia said, but I, you speak to Israelis here and they really don't understand how can anyone blame them of being the aggressor, of, bring, of blaming the bully, especially when there are hostages still, still in Gaza. And you know, the oldest hostages just celebrated his, celebrated his 86th birthday and there's a baby who's probably not alive, uh, one, one year old. So so uh, we are, um, they don't feel that they are, um, they don't feel that they are um, uh, to blame of anything. And there is this narrative, Nathan spoke about how Israelis view Gaza. Um, there's this narrative that there are no innocent people in Gaza. That they're all uh, terrorists, helping to be terrorists. The kids will turn, to, will grow to be terrorists. And therefore, a lot of things are justified. Oh, what can you do? They attacked us. No background, no context, right? This is what's happening. And therefore, we are right. And it's very uh, difficult, even, even today, when you're seeing the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, it's like, oh, there's no humanitarian crisis. What can you do? Tough life, there's war, um, which is very, very um, uh, difficult, I think, to convince Israelis here. And, 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 and you speak with, with uh, very senior uh, media commentators here and, you know, TV. I mean, uh, they admit that the public just doesn't want to see it, so they don't broadcast it. And and I I think it's it's a problem because Israelis live in in an alternative uh, universe, on the Biden administration. Um, so so um, uh, um, Natan uh, gave gave the overview. There is uh, obviously we can't speak about is one Israel. There are a lot of Israelis who are very concerned about um, about um, the statements coming from the Biden administration, uh, some slowdowns, logistical hurdles that could slow uh, down um, uh, weapon uh, uh, shipments to Israel and uh, snubbing of uh, Israelis, uh, Israeli uh, leaders. Uh, but there's also another story that you hear from Israeli leaders that say, well, they have domestic politics. They actually agree with, with us on everything. It, everything they're saying is just because they have their uh, their elections coming at home. So even Schumer, he's just he's concerned by Van Hollen and he's challenged. So, so he has to say something that caters to his crowd. Now, it doesn't mean uh, that uh, Schumer does not have domestic political considerations, but um it's also, I think, uh, plausible to assume that the Biden administration is really horrified by, you know, the death toll in Gaza and by the famine and by other issues and by the lack of aid entering. And it's not just about domestic uh, politics. Another thing that I think we should take away from Schumer is if someone like Schumer, who is extremely careful, right, and he's extremely cautious, and we already know that he checked uh, his speech with the Biden administration folks before, if he sees no political cost to basically snubbing Netanyahu, I think that all of the dreams here in Israel, and you still hear it from Israeli leaders, that a Saudi normalization with Israel, which would come with um, with the defense treaty for the Saudis and uranium, you know, a nuclear program with uranium enrichment, to think, to assume that there will be 67 votes in the Senate when Bibi is still around. To me, I think this 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 is sort of a proof that uh, we not that I had expected uh, any Saudi normalization anytime soon, but I think this is sort of the proof that shows that it's not going to happen anytime soon. Because what what is what is the um, uh, it, it doesn't seem to me that any we will have those sixty seven uh, votes. Uh, it was a big assumption before, and and now even more so. And I guess finally, the last thing is that you know. You, you have the Biden administration and largely the rest of the world 
uh, thinking that the only solution or the only or the least uh, bad outcome of this conflict, right, is a two state solution. Uh, peaceful separation between Israelis and Palestinians, understanding that you can't, there's no just military solution. And Israelis have not been in this mindset, Dalia said, since the second Intifada, really. Uh, there hasn't been really a peace process. Um, and the question really is, how do you bring, bring Israelis on board? Um, you know, some Israeli politicians that I speak to, even from the left, even they are scared of saying two-state solution or talking about a Palestinian state because it just sounds tone deaf to Israelis at the moment. Uh, there's, you know, Richard Haas, the former uh, president of the Council of Foreign Relations. He came up with this idea of Biden giving a speech to the Israeli public at the Knesset. Biden said he's not going to do it at the Knesset. Maybe an article in in an in Israeli newspaper like uh, Yusuf Al-Taiba, the Emirati ambassador to Washington, did when he posed to Israelis the questions of annexation versus normalization. I, I don't know that it will help, but I think... Um, the Israeli public, whether it's uh, 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 the message comes from Biden or it's uh, uh, inherently understood, um, has very stark choice. You know, does have very clear choice to make. It's either you know Israel becoming Sparta, and we're already seeing some of the priorities and the change of priorities here in this country with 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 with, with you know the defense budget is going to spike uh, at the expense of other agricultural and academic institutions that are very much needed for this country. Um, possibly entering this pariah status, look what's happening in the US, Dan, you're on, you're on campus. I don't know that there's ever been such an anti-Israel sentiment uh, historically. And this is the United States. I'm not even talking about other places in the world, right? Um, normalization agreements that are, argue, I wouldn't say frozen, but but have have chilled uh, substantially uh, since since the beginning of this war. And the fact that yes, you don't you think a Palestinian state is um, would be a threat, but what's the alternative? Everyone living together, uh, entering long term occupation in Gaza, uh, which will surely come with military rule. Uh, and we've been through this before. The IDF has done this before. As Israel, we've done this before. Um, so I think while we don't know what the what the Biden sort of vision uh, proposes, and there's no guarantees that it's going to success, going to succeed, for sure we know what's the alternative. <laughs> we know where we're going elsewhere, and this is the challenge of how do you convey this to the Israeli public and the and the um, politicians who see the country's interest uh, ahead of their own. Thank you, Shira, for um, devoting your voice to the quality of this program. Really appreciate it. Just one note on Princeton. Um, what we've tried to do is stay a little bit ahead of the protests. There are protests, but uh, we've also had a vigorous round of roundtables and uh, speeches in order to uh, indicate to students that discussion and uh, interaction uh, academically and intellectually can actually help a little bit. Let's do a lightning round. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the q and A. I'll start with Dahlia. Dahlia, the one thing you didn't mention with regard to the possibility of new elections is what some people think is an inevitable commission of inquiry. Uh, Israel has a long history of having these commissions after major events. Uh, is it likely that there will be one? Will Netanyahu try to block it? If the commission does point to significant not just military and intelligence failures, but also policy failures, does that impact a prime minister as it did with Golda Meir in 1974? Yeah, I mean, I think that the major dilemma about a commission of inquiry is type and timing. Sorry, I should have said the major dilemmas because there are two dilemmas. Type in terms of whether it's a truly independent commission as we call uh, we, we call it in Hebrew, like a public commission, a commission of inquiry, versus a government commission of inquiry. And so there's little question in my mind that there will be some commission of inquiry. And there's little question in my mind that the government, this current government under Netanyahu has an interest in it not being a completely independent commission of inquiry and that the public will not be happy about that. It could be this you know, major source of tension. And the other, but that's closely related to the issue of timing. So the question about whether there will be a commission of inquiry almost doesn't matter for elections if it's, if it's unless it's held before elections. And I think that is, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces here because all of that will depend on how the war is going. 
Um, I don't think we're going to see elections while the war is still at the phase we're in now until we reach some sort of a ceasefire. The ceasefire itself is unpredictable. Is it going to be temporary? Is it going to be 40 days, six weeks? Is it going to open up a longer term ceasefire? If so, that will probably lead to the kinds of processes that will set in motion elections. But in that case, I think it's unlikely that there's going to be a you know, full independent uh, commission that would be a commission of inquiry before elections are held. And so if they're held afterwards, then in any case, we might have election results. And then there's not such a question of whether Netanyahu falls, assuming that he falls in elections. If he should win the next election, and there has not yet been any sort of commission of inquiry, and there is a commission of inquiry, and it's independent after elections, then I imagine that its findings will blame Netanyahu significantly, and that could lead to his downfall. However, we have recent precedent to go on if we're looking at how Israeli governments versus Netanyahu respond to commissions of inquiry, because we just had the findings of a commission of inquiry with relation to the disaster at Meron Mountain back in 2021, when it was Israel's biggest civil disaster ever. Over 40 people were trampled to death. Netanyahu was prime minister. His appointments were the heads of the relevant ministries, and the report was pretty scathing against him. And he basically just, you know, I don't think we can assume that Netanyahu would respond to the findings the way Golda Meir did. Um, he just brushed them off and he basically did everything he could to absolve himself of responsibility. Um, and that is, I think, uh, a standard that he has legitimized over his you know, cumulative 16 years of governance, that whatever goes wrong on his watch and the worst things in the country, the worst civilian disaster and the worst military disaster have happened under Netanyahu's leadership. And he manages to you know, establish a governing ethos and legitimize that ethos, whereby the, the you know the ruling political leadership does not take responsibility for anything that goes wrong. Um, and I, you know, yes, there will be massive protests at some point, right? Either when the war downscales and there's a ceasefire, or when the war is over, or if there's a commission of inquiry, or even if even if there's we just go into an election cycle, uh, there will be massive protests as part of rallies. I have no doubt. But again, look at how Netanyahu responded to 2023 uh, versus how Golda Meir responded to a few weeks of mass protests after the 73 war. You know, she couldn't take the pressure and resigned, which is, I think, what most prime ministers would have done. And by the way, I have a theory that Ehud Olmert also, after the Lebanon war in 2006, there were massive protests. Now, they led to terrible poll number. I mean, his poll numbers were about the lowest I've seen at, at that time you know, after the second Lebanon war and in light of those protests. And he eventually resigned mostly because of his uh, imminent indictments over on corruption charges. But I think that that going through that probably contributed to his sense that he was failing on all fronts. Netanyahu doesn't accept any of that. He is already standing trial for corruption. These are things that were inconceivable in the past. And so, you know, back to your original question, there may be a commission of inquiry. It might even be an independent commission of inquiry at some point. But I don't, you know, there's too many moving parts for me to say whether that will happen in time to influence the political leadership. Got it. Continuing our line. My colleagues are welcome to weigh in. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, sure. Uh, Natan, um, with two notable exceptions, uh, AWACS to Saudi Arabia and uh, loan guarantees, uh, Israel has always relied upon, prime ministers have always relied upon Congress to uh, make sure that uh, somebody in the United States has their back when they have a problem with the administration. Doesn't the Schumer speech signal that that may not be the case here? We already had, what, about 20 progressive Democrats uh, raising very serious questions. And now the most centrist pro-Israel supportive uh, in the Senate uh, or on the Democratic side of the Senate uh, has shopped uh, this across the Israeli bow. So yes and no. On the one hand, uh, we're seeing a coming to fruition and real an acceleration of a process that we've seen for a long time. But it's not so much of Congress going one way or the other, but rather Congress bifurcating. So if you look at overall support for Israel in the United States, even today, it's very high. And even in the context of the war, Americans are far more supportive of Israel than they are of the Palestinians. But if you split that by party and by age, you see dramatically different things. So on the Democratic side, What's happened now, as Shiro said, Schumer is doing this, he's also a politician. He knows he probably is paying a price for it, but it's not the kind of price he would have paid for it 10 years ago, nothing close, including in his own state of New York with his own base. 
And therefore, what we're seeing on the Democratic side is not, and it's not, it's the progressives, of course, going in one direction. But much more important from the Israeli perspective, it's the moderates all the way to Schumer who have a different calculus now, who have a calculus that says it is not by default a good idea to simply stand by Israel in every question. And that changes the calculus completely. But I'll note on the Republican side, that's not the case at all. On the Republican side, still, we see dramatic support for Israel. The intensity of emotion right now is far less dramatic than it is on the Democratic side. And intensity of preferences is very important, not only the direction of the preferences, but still what we're seeing here is this bifurcation. It also has an age issue, of course. Democrats in particular uh, have a very big uh, chasm even between older Democrats and younger Democrats in the same family as well, even among American Jews too, within the same family, a real big difference. Um, but we're seeing Israel becoming more and more a, what used to be called domestic football. So really an issue between the two parties. That's clearly not good for Israel. I would say it's also very bad for Palestinians. I don't think it's a good, uh, it's got bad for America. Foreign policy, when it becomes partisan, is usually less effective, is usually affected by things that are less than substantive, obviously. Um, but it's becoming a reality. And I don't think it's going away. I don't think this is an issue that is simply um, temporary. Uh, we're already seeing long-standing shifts in the Democratic Party. This is accelerating them. They have to do both with changes in the United States and, of course, with Israeli policy and what's happening there. Two last points on this. One is that, to a large degree, Israel be Israel and the Israeli-Palestinian issue have become or have become even more of a domestic policy issue. They always were domestic policy, but now they are even more so. And they resonate with domestic American concerns that often have nothing to do, honestly, with uh, the river or the sea, especially because most people don't know what river and what sea they're talking about. Uh, and I don't fault them for it. It's far away. Why would they know the river or the sea? Um, but it becomes an echo of domestic issues uh, on both sides, very much for American Jews and for supporters of Israel, of course, and among, among conservative evangelical Americans. It, it resonates their own concerns domestically. And now very much so also on the other side, to my mind, has not all that much to do with, with what's happening uh, in the land itself. And again, to my mind, not helpful uh, in any way in that regard. And this, for from the Israeli perspective, um, could mean a bit of a pendulum. With one caveat, and this I'll end, we heard Donald Trump just now, we may, you may know him, he's the former president and he's the Republican nominee. Uh, he spoke of uh, calling Netanyahu, Netanyahu should have ended this war quickly. We need peace in the Middle East. The Trump administration, to my mind, really believed that its plan, its peace for prosperity plan was a serious plan. They thought so at least. And I think they, or at least he probably still has this image of he could bring peace. And in any case, war is bad for business. And so I would not be surprised if Trump, just if he, if he were elected, would disappoint quite a few quite a few Israelis in terms of his position, what he would demand. We also know Barack Ravid wrote this in a book, uh, an exclusive interview with Trump. Trump is extremely angry with Netanyahu because Netanyahu made the major sin of congratulating Joe Biden uh, over his election. Yeah, that's true. And uh, as part of what Trump said in response to uh, Chuck Schumer, he also tied it to politics, asking how Democrats can remain, uh, how can Jews who vote Democrat remain committed to the Democratic Party? So it is uh, political football. Shira, uh, both uh, one of our viewers and I want you to answer a question that you raised. How, if at all, can Israel be brought to support a two-state solution? We hear when things are peaceful, that there's no motivation to change the status quo. And we hear that when Israel is in a war and is rallying around the flag, it should not be asked to change the status quo. So what, what are the conditions under which Israel can be asked to look in the mirror and uh, decide that maybe an alternative to settlements and uh, occupation uh, is a better uh, way to proceed? Well, you know, thank you. And I think, Dan, you dedicated big parts of your life to trying to do just that. So I, I don't think there's an easy, there's an easy answer. Um, and I'm not sure it needs to come from the outside. You know, I'm, I'm debating this myself. There's a lot of, uh, there, there's, there's a lot of argument that can only come when it's uh, a forced solution. But then you look at Oslo and how Oslo started and, and sort of realization between Israelis and Palestinians themselves, right? Obviously with an international cover. 
that it should be something that uh, people here realize. I am not, um, you know, public opin opinion on these questions to me is less concerning because I think that absent leadership takes you in this direction. It's really hard to pull when something sounds so detached from something that anyone in this country is talking about. And maybe Yair Lapid at one point said to stick solution. I don't think he's saying it these days. He did say it before. But, you know, he has a very, uh, he has a constituency, but it's, but it's a small one. Um, and even his, uh, his, his supporters are not there. So the convincing, the, be the best thing would, would be obviously is to grow leadership or to have leadership that sub subscribes to this idea. And then I think people would, would follow. Uh, but you know, uh, changing leadership is not exactly a policy prescription. I wish we could do we could do that very easily. Um, but looking at it sort of like from a scholarly point of view, right, and from what we can do, I think there's a lot of setting the record straight that needs to be done. You hear from Israelis, and by the way, also from Palestinians. I'm not going to talk about the Palestinians now, but you hear, oh, we've been in this peace process for so long, it has failed. If you look actively at how many years we're actually been negotiating peace, I think it's like 6% of the time, 5% of the time in the last 30 decades. I mean, I did the math once and I need to, you know, sort of adapt it because, but more years have passed. We really have not been in, in a peace process. Um, explaining that the Palestinian Authority, yes, we tend to view it as part of the problem, but it could turn into part of the solution if it does one, two, three, four, and there are many things that they need to be doing. Explaining that we can't equate Hamas with you, a partner that does uh, do uh, security cooperation. And, and also showing the real cost, because what I think that Israelis are not getting now, and this is a part that would depend on the international community, you know, Israel in the West Bank, right? It um, has uh, the Palestinian Authority, which is sort of the government of the Palestinian people and the effectiveness of which it provides services is very debatable, right? But at least they do it. The international community pays for them, the Europeans mostly, right? But European support and other support. And Israel has the freedom of operation, basically security, and it could, could raid into area A, area B. And I think there's an Israeli assumption that we will be able to do whatever we want in Gaza and the international community is gonna bankroll this thing. And if Israelis are find themselves uh, um, uh, spending uh, big parts of their budget on uh, the children of Gaza, educating the children of Gaza and healthcare in Gaza, because you know it is Israel's responsibility at the moment. It's, as long as Israel's there, I think those questions will start coming. Um, so it's both sort of like the positive and the negative. Uh, but um, you know, if you have better ideas, <laughs> would love that. Yeah, I'm I'm working on them. <laughs> Let me ask uh, two very quick questions, and we're just about ready to to conclude. Uh, one is we've talked about uh, eighty percent of the Israeli public, but the there's a twenty percent of Palestinian Israelis. Uh, will they make a difference in uh, the electoral situation uh, afterwards? And the other question is, what will make a difference in the American electoral scene? Uh, there's concern that. Uh, Palace, uh, Arab Americans in Michigan won't vote. Uh, it may cost uh, Biden one of the uh, battleground states. Young people may not vote. Um, what are the electoral impacts here of uh, Gaza? Uh, maybe start with Dahlia and then we'll do Natan and Shira, two sentences each. Two sentences. I was just asked yeah. to talk about 20% of the population. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll I'll cut it down because actually if we're talking about whether they can influence elections, we're talking about more like 17% of the voting population, partly because there's a young, a young population that is not eligible yet and partly because that 2 million generally includes the 250 something thousand who are not citizens who are living in East Jerusalem as permanent residents and who don't vote in Israeli elections. Um, so the short answer is absolutely they can influence the outcome of Israeli elections, Palestinian and citizens of Israel. Um, and that is, I think, largely dependent on the fact that the opposition parties, well, there are numerous. I mean, if by opposition, we mean any party that was not part of the original pre-war coalition. So that means everybody from Gidon Saar's new breakaway with four seats currently to Benny Gantz, to Avigdor Lieberman, many of these are right-wing parties, but they are fragmented and they are small. 
And the, uh, you know, as we know from 2021, okay, maybe the situation will have changed, but they, yeah, those opposition parties barely, barely could, they, they couldn't reach a majority coalition without the support of one of the parties representing Palestinian citizens of Israel. And we could likely have some sort of situation like that, even if it looks like those opposition parties are doing better right now. But it very much depends on, I think, those, those citizens themselves. And the reason is because turnout has been very different and much lower among Palestinian citizens of Israel than among Jewish citizens. And so when you look at the Israeli electorate, you can imagine 17%, they should be getting you know, 20 seats in the Israeli, roughly 20 seats out of 120. But in fact, most in most recent cycles, they've only gotten between 10 and 15 seats as their range. And so yes, they could have a lot more significance in coalition bargaining um, and in opening up the political options if they were to vote at the same, same rate as the Jewish population, and the gap is pretty big right now. We have between you know 45 and 55 percent, roughly, maybe over 60 percent, depending on the constellation of parties who are running, among Palestinian citizens who vote. And by the best estimates that I can make, uh, which is complicated for reasons I won't get into, probably over 80 percent of the Jewish population who votes in, regularly in elections. And so closing that gap is paramount. I urge everybody who has any citizen friend to encourage all of their uh, citizen friends in any country, frankly, to exercise their their vote, their right to vote, but in Israel in particular, because this is an underrepresented and key population in Israeli elections. Thanks, Natan. Uh, yeah, just to add one note on that issue is also very interesting dynamics, of course, happening among uh, the population, the twenty percent, uh, with different strands, those who are who are trying to integrate even politically, as we saw with the Ram Party joining the Bennett uh, Lapid coalition. And so it's very interesting, and of course, the population is that it's in a that is in a very difficult position right now. Citizens of Israel in the midst of, of this kind of war. On the American side, um, you know, I have colleagues who are real experts on American politics, but I'll say two seemingly contradictory things. On the one hand, the effect, the direct effect, is my guess is it's smaller than people think. This is a very high intensity issue right now. And for some populations, it will be enormously important, certainly for Palestinian Americans, I think for many Arab Americans. Um, but hopefully we'll have a ceasefire by then. And by the time November comes, there are many other issues at stake. That said, and this is the contradictory point, um, these elections are probably likely going to be very close and they will be decided probably by a relatively small number of people in just a few states, Michigan quite possibly being one of them with a very large Arab and Muslim American population. And so could there be an effect? Certainly there could be. It could be on the margin and the margin might be enough. Uh, and now my third and final point, whether it actually does affect things or not, and I am skeptical that anyone really knows, to be perfectly honest, this is all conjecture at the moment. If Biden loses, I am quite convinced there are many who will blame this. Correct or incorrect. And they might be right. I don't know. But I think there will be many who will blame this. And if we mentioned the dynamics in the Democratic Party before, if there will be many in the Democratic Party who believe or suspect that Joe Biden lost the election to Donald Trump and brought four years of Donald Trump, at least, um, you know, the, the Constitution can, might go away, uh, could be eight or 12 years, um, they will not forget that. And it will even... You know, turbocharge this issue of Israel as a as a partisan, political, and extremely divisive issue. Shira, you get the last word. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just say on the um, Palestinian citizens of Israel, I think there's there's, there's there's a big opportunity, not just politically, right, but there's a lot of conversation in Israel about sharing the burden and about the draft of the Haredi uh, population into the IDF. And there's 21% of the population that need to be uh, better integrated in society and economy. Sadly, I, I don't hear our uh, politicians speak about it at the moment, but I do have to, I do believe, hope that this will come and, you know, it comes also with political participation eventually, but the, but I actually do see, and this is where, where you need, why you have to have a new government, because with this government, you can move along any of these things is on the domestic issues. I 100% agree with Natan on um if, if Biden is perceived to have lost this, these elections because of Israel, I don't just don't see any Democrat uh, supporting Israel ever again. Um, and <laughs> anecdotally, I just spoke with someone from um, from the prime, I mean, someone who claims to be speaking with people in the prime minister's office, I'll say it like that. And they said, you know, there's a speculation that now would actually prefer that Biden would win uh, because with Biden, he knows how to work and Trump could become very unpredictable. <laughs>
uh, even for him. So I think it is it is interesting. But just in the interest of time, thank you um, for having me and entertaining my voice. <laughs> Well, uh, the three of you never disappoint. This was extraordinarily rich. Uh, I appreciate it personally, and I know that everyone who tuned in uh, has learned a great deal. So thank you so much. Uh, just to remind, on Wednesday, also at 1230, we'll have a parallel panel on Palestinian politics after a ceasefire with, among others, former Prime Minister Salam Fayyad and notable pollster Halil Shikaki. So please tune in. Uh, you can find uh, information on how to register on the school's uh, website. Uh, so thank you and uh, everybody be safe. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for hosting us.